Thank you very much. Nice to see you. How are you doing? It's a lovely day, isn't it? Cold, but the sun's shining. And my dog is outside in the car, hoping to get a wee walk after this. So I used to live near here, uh, near Pencateland, so it's nice to be back. So you're from Pencateland, are you? Right, and the gorgeous red, you are from this school? Yes. Ormston, and you're from Humby. That's great, fantastic. So I'm from Edinburgh originally, and about, mm, about 10 years ago, I got a job, and there I was living in Edinburgh. Let's say Edinburgh's there, okay? And this job was in a place called John O'Groats, and I didn't even know where that was, but anyway, I got in my wee car, and I started driving, driving up, kind of over the fourth road bridge. Anybody been there? Okay, well done. And through Fife, anybody been there? Yeah, and then keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, Inverness? Okay, right, you're big travellers here. And uh, keep going in my wee car. And then I come to Rossshire and Sutherland and Caithness. Anybody ever been there? John O'Groats, anybody ever been there? Okay, all right, well, it is right at the very top of Scotland. And I realised that day, Scotland's a very big country. At least it's very long. It took me a long, long, long time to get up there. And I had a wonderful job as a writer in residence. It's quite good, isn't it? Get paid to write stories. So I lived in a wee cottage right next to the beach. Anybody here ever lived next to the beach? Or what about being on holiday? You've been on holiday next to the beach. Okay, fantastic. So I felt like I was on holiday for five years. So I had this wee cottage, and so there's the cottage, right? Wee cottage. And then there's a kind of garden, just a bit of grass, actually. And then stony beach, and then the sea. Got that? Okay, so there I am, right, in my wee house, doing a bit of writing. But I also did quite a lot of gazing out the window. Do you do that sometimes? Yeah, look, you can see the sky. Anyway, I could see the sea. And I was really hoping that I might see a shark or a whale or something exciting, which is why I kept looking out the window. Anyway, after a few days, I did see something in the sea and I didn't know what it was and it was like a black arm like that sticking up through the water slightly to the side and it didn't move and there was nothing else around yeah and it wasn't that far out yeah so there's kind of flat sea and this black arm well it you know that's what it looked like sticking out the water and I thought that's weird so it wasn't moving, so I thought, okay, you are not a whale, you're not a shark. And I went back to my writing, and about an hour later or so, I looked again, and the thing had gone. So this went on for a few days. Yeah, there's me at the windy, doing a bit of writing, gazing out the windy. And sometimes I can see the thing in the sea, and sometimes I can't. And when I see it, it's always in exactly the same place. And then I figured something out. It took me quite a while to work this out. But I could see the thing in the sea when... You ready for a bit of acting here? Okay, when the... So oh, somebody said it. Tide. Yes, well done. When the tide was out, right? I could see that thing. But when the tide, do you all know what tides are, actually? Yeah, it's like the sea breathing in and out. So when the tide came in, the thing was swallowed up. But I still didn't know what it was. So anybody here want to have a wee guess? What do you think that thing was? Or I should say is, because if you go way up to the far north of Scotland, it's still there. What do you think? Nope. Nope. But well done for being the first to guess. Not a rock. What do you think? Yeah. Kilmarnock. 
killer whale. Woo, no. No, because, you know, I reckoned it's, it's, not, it's not alive because it doesn't move. What do you think? An owl. Okay, all right, right, a narwhal. Okay, one of these creatures like that, yeah. Kind of like a unicorn, aren't they? Yes, no. Remember, guys, put your thinking caps on. It doesn't move, this thing. Right, let's go over here a little bit. What do you think? You're close. He said submarine. Right, he's the closest so far. What do you think? Well done. Did you already know? Okay. All right, yes. So it is the mast of a sunken ship. But unlike Forbes, is that, yes, unlike Forbes who guessed that it was a shipwreck, I didn't. And I had to go down to the fisherman and say, what's that thing in the sea? And he said, that is the mast of a sunken battleship that was torpedoed in the Second World War and burst into flames and sunk. So anyway, you might be sitting there thinking, why is Janice Mackay telling us this story. Well, I'll tell you why. Because that wee story, which is a true story, for me, it was the beginning of becoming an author. So I said to myself, I said, wow, you know, I thought that was pretty amazing that I learned that the sea is, uh, is actually got a lot of sunken ships in it. And one of them not just any old ship, but, uh, you know, a very famous battleship was right in front of me. And then I said to myself, how about if I can invent a boy who's about 10 years old and this boy can breathe on the land, like you can, yeah, but he could also breathe under the sea. Because, see, when you're a writer, you can make things up, can't you? Yeah. So I created a boy... And I thought, right, I'll send him under the sea. And he can have all kind of adventures. And he can explore all these sunken ships. And that's what I did. So I wrote a book, and it won a big prize. And I got lots of money, which was great. And so basically, you know, a year after I saw that sunken ship, and I thought, aha, I could write a story about a boy who has adventures under the sea. So a year later, this book came out called Magnus Finn and the Ocean Quest. So ideas have got to start somewhere, haven't they? Yeah? So that's just a kind of, you know, a wee story of how, how I began to get books published, which was great. And, you know, the publishers, they said, we like Magnus Finn, could you write another book? So I said, okay. So I wrote this book called Magnus Finn and what's this called? The Moonlight Mission, More Adventures Under the Sea. So tell me, what does not happen to Magnus Finn at the end of this book? Bit of a trick question. What's that? He doesn't die because he's got another book to get busy with. So it's sometimes quite nice to know a character doesn't die. And then they said, would you write another book? So I wrote a third, Magnus Finn and Selkie Secret. And does anybody know the name for a collection of three books that kind of belong together? Yeah. A series could be a series, although actually you could have seven books in a series. You know, you could have loads. But there's a particular word only for three well done. Yeah. So this is a trilogy, you know, three books, all because of what? That's right. All because I saw the mast of the sunken ship. And if you've got good eyes, you might be able to see on the front cover here. What's that? That's it. Yeah, that is the mast of the sunken ship. And if you go up to the far north of Scotland and walk along that lonely little beach, and if the tide is out, you might see that famous sunken ship. So let me ask you a wee question. So I've already said to you that for 
a writer, you gotta have ideas, yeah? And they can start anywhere. But let me ask you, what else do you think a writer needs? What do you think? Things to write with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I tell you, writing can be a very, very cheap hobby. Yeah, it's not like horse riding or skiing that cost your parents a fortune. But actually, you could write a book with a pencil and paper. Okay, what else does a writer need? What do you think? You think about it. What do you think? Just because you've not got your hands up doesn't mean I won't ask you. What do you think? Paper. Yeah, paper, absolutely. What else? An imagination. <gasps> An imagination. Okay, that's a big word. Let's just have a wee look at that word, shall we? Imagination. It's quite a big word, and it begins with image. So what is an image? That's right. An image is a picture. So here is one of my books, okay? And I'll just open it randomly. Where are the pictures? Uh, this is also a trick question. Somebody's got the answer up here. Yes, where are the pictures? Well done. Yeah, the pictures are in your head. So I also think if we go back to that word imagination, I think you've got the root of the word magic in there. And I think reading is magic. Because, you know, let's face it, okay? These are boring black squiggles on a white bit of paper, right? Totally not exciting, yeah? But because you are having this wonderful thing called an education, yeah? Then you're learning to turn these wee black squiggles into stories. Yeah? into pictures in your head. So imagination is the ability to create pictures in your head. So I'm going to test your imaginations. Are you sitting up straight? Did you have a good breakfast? Yeah? <laughs> okay, I had a bacon roll. Anybody else have a bacon roll? Oh, okay, right, snap. Okay, so if I say to you, can you please imagine and by that, I mean, can you picture in your mind, it's round about here, yeah, a red rose. Go. Teachers too. You all got it. Can you? Yeah, can you all see? Well, you have to work a bit harder, yeah? So this is imaginative seeing, yeah? You got a red rose? You got one? You, what about you? You got one? Okay, all right, now you know what is really exciting is that if I was to go and open your head, a bit weird, and if I was to kind of see your red rose, it would be different from yours, yeah? And it would be different from everybody's because you are all unique, yeah? You are all absolutely different. So let's make it a bit more difficult, okay? All right, so when I snap my fingers, I'd like you to change that red rose into a yellow rose. Go. Done it? Teachers, you got it? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, let's make it more difficult, seeing as you're all so brilliant. You all know what tartan is? Yeah? So there are lots and lots of different kinds of tartan. You're going to imagine your kind of tartan and you're going to change the yellow rose into a tartan rose. Go. Can you do it? Good. So, you know, that is actually pretty amazing. And there are no tartan roses growing in the gardens in Scotland, but in the garden of your imagination, you can grow all kinds of things. Yeah? Now, the problem is, when you sit in front of a screen, yeah, what you're doing, yeah, whether you're playing a computer game or watching the television or watching a film, what you're doing is you're watching somebody else's imagination. 
Yeah? And if you're too often sitting in front of a screen, it means that your own fantastic imagination can kind of think, there's nothing for me to do. Yeah? And it can get a bit lazy. So I would really recommend, I know you don't probably like hearing this advice, but I would recommend kind of finding where the off button is. Do you all know where the off button is? Yeah, and turning that off and picking up a book. Or asking somebody, if you've got an auntie or a grandfather or whatever, say, could you tell me a story? Yeah, and that way, through storytelling and through reading, you're really exercising your imagination. Okay, any more questions? Not questions. We'll come to questions at the end. Uh, my question to you, any more answers, was what else does a writer need? Yes, yeah, so that was a bit of a long explanation of imagination. What else? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so actually, I would take that a bit further and say that in order to be a writer, yeah, you've got to notice things, yeah? So see when you go for a walk, or see when you go to school, or see at playtime, have a look and see what you can see. So let me ask you, what did you notice this morning? What did you notice? A frog. Frost. frost. OK, frost. OK, all right. What else? What did you notice? Two what tied up? Good. Now, you see, with a bit of imagination, yeah, you've already got the beginnings of a story. It was a frosty morning at the end of November. And for some strange reason, there were two dogs tied up outside a house. What could come next? There was a light flickering. Good. Flickering's good. Yeah, that's a bit mysterious. Okay, two dogs tied up, a light flickering. What's going to happen next in the story that we are suddenly making up? Yes. Okay, one of the dogs breaks its lead. All right, and does it run away? Okay, oh, what's going to happen next? What do you think? Yeah. The house explodes because of that flickering. Okay, oh, oh, the house explodes. Okay, so suddenly, very dramatic. But anyway, do you see what I mean? Yeah, you could start a story from anything. Yeah, you just look around you, and then you just put your imagination hat on and, uh, you know, turn it into a story. Okay, so I would just like to show you something. I did not write this. A wee lassie wrote this. This is a diary, and it's written by a girl called Marjorie Fleming. And the really exciting thing about this diary, let me show you. Uh, yeah, look at that for handwriting. Can you see it? Yeah. OK, so she's eight years old, and she lived 200 years ago. So it was pretty exciting to find a diary of an eight-year-old girl from Scotland, and this was written in 1811. So um, if you want to see the real diary, you can go to the National, what's it called? National Library on George IV Bridge. So Marjorie Fleming was born in Kirkcaldy 200 years ago. Now tell me, do you think? children 200 years ago went to school who thinks yes okay what kind of children 200 years ago went to school yeah yeah rich boys or rich girls rich boys so rich boys went to school which is not fair is it Totally not fair. Yeah, so 200 years ago, only rich boys with their little top hats and their wee shorts. Yeah, 
and their wee books, they would go to school. What about the rest of you? Yeah? If you were alive 200 years ago, now I'm not saying that none of you are rich boys, but what might you have been doing? Yeah, what do you think? Tidying the house. Yeah, okay, tidying the house. Now, let's say you're scrubbing the floor or something. Do you just go up to the tap uh, to get water in that house? Where do you get your water from? That's right. Yeah, you might go with your bucket to a well or you might even go to a river. So quite hard work. So some of you might be tidying the house. What else might some of you be doing? Yeah? I wonder, I, I, I wonder if people were sitting bored doing nothing. I wonder. Maybe, maybe. They did not. Uh, they didn't. What do you think? Cleaning chimneys. Yes, yeah. If you're a very skinny little boy, yeah, of about five or six years old, you might be cleaning a chimney. What else might you be doing? Sleeping. Well, that's true, especially in the winter. Why might you sleep a lot in the winter? You get cold, that's true. And what else? No school. <laughs> there's also no... What's that up there? Aye, there's no electricity 200 years ago. Yeah, so it was a very, very different world. Very different world. But Marjorie, remember we Marjorie? Yeah, she wanted to have an education. There you are, you've all got an education. Aren't you lucky? She really wanted one. So in those days, to get an education, you had to find somebody to teach you. So she was sent away on her own. She's only eight. Who's eight here? Yeah, so imagine you've got your wee coat on, yeah, your wee suitcase, and you go all the way from Kirkcaldy. There's no fourth road bridge. You get on a boat, uh, yeah, and you go to Edinburgh. And you live with your aunt and uncle and your cousin. She's called Isabella. She's 19, and she is your teacher. Now, in this house in Edinburgh, they have a pet, not a dog, not a cat, a little pet with a red jacket that became Marjorie's friend. Any ideas what kind of pet you might have 200 years ago? Well done, yes, a little monkey. So Marjorie writes poems about her monkey. She writes poems about Mary Queen of Scots. She writes in this diary about the very exciting day that she went to a little shop in Edinburgh and for the first time in her life saw a pineapple. And she's so excited about a pineapple that she draws the pineapple. Anyway, dear Marjorie died before her ninth birthday, but her diary was kept and her mother kept the diary. And then some years later, this diary was published and Marjorie Fleming became famous in her death as Scotland's best child writer. So I found this diary and I read it and I said to myself, what if I could write a book where a girl from 200 years ago came and landed up into our time? So do you remember I told you about the sunken ship? Yeah, yeah. So, and that's how I wrote Magnus Finn. So it was thanks to Marjorie Fleming that I wrote this book. And this book's got a very exciting thing on it. Can anybody read it? Yeah, yeah, winner. So this, uh, I also got a lot of money for that. How good. Uh, this won a big prize, which was great. But anyway, this lassie here, can you see her? Yeah, well, she is, you know, she's modelled on Marjorie. Yeah, and in this diary, you know, I had an idea of how children 200 years ago in Scotland spoke. So I used that as my inspiration. And this is Sol. 
And Saul is just a normal boy. In fact, he's sometimes a bit of a naughty boy. He doesn't do his homework and he has been grounded. Anybody ever been grounded here? Okay, lots of you. Okay, so you can relate to Saul. Yeah, anyway, Saul has had to stay in for three whole days and he's fed up. And at last his mum says, okay, you can go along to the shop, get a packet of biscuits and come straight back. Okay? And he says, all right. And it's winter time and he is walking so slowly. Do you ever do that? Yeah. Yeah? You know, if you want something to really last, you walk slowly. So that's what Saul's doing, walking very slowly on his way to the shop when suddenly something happens that changes his life. And I'll just read you a wee bit, if that's okay. Is that all right? Yes. You doing okay? Yes. Bottom not too sore? No? <laughs> yes? Okay, you've read some of it. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Yeah, look. Yes. Yeah, okay, here we go. All right. So it's written in what's called first person point of view. Are there any P7s here? So can you tell everybody what that means? Any of you know? Yes? Yeah? Yeah? That's right, yeah. So I'm pretending, right? I'm pretending that I am an 11-year-old boy. Yeah? So I'm saying I... So I am letting Saul be the storyteller. So it's great fun being a writer because you can, you get to do all kinds of things. How are you doing over there? You okay? You're quite far away. All right. It was now one minute to ten. The corner shop came into view. I felt something wet brush my cheek. I looked up. White flakes were swirling through the air and landing on me. I like snow. I opened my mouth to catch a snowflake. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, try it, yeah? (laughs) It's quite a nice feeling. Yeah. Okay, so Saul's like that, right? Uh, One snowflake landed on my tongue, which was exactly when the church bells rang for 10 o'clock, which was exactly when a car screeched its tires, blared its horn, and someone screamed really loudly. I swung round to see a screaming girl in fancy dress standing stock still in the middle of the road, her arms flung out to the side and her face pale as a ghost. The screeching car swerved around her and roared off. Hope that's never happened to any of you, has it? Oh, has it? Have you almost got yourself knocked over? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, thankfully you are still here with us. The girl's screams turned to whimpers and gasps, and she stumbled across the road in a panic, tripped over the curb, look for a boy here, and fell down at my feet. She buried her face in her hands and started sobbing. I looked around for her mum or her big sister or someone, but no one was there. So I bent down and patted her on the shoulder, feeling seriously awkward. Hey! I said, are you okay? She pulled her hands away from her face, stopped crying and gazed up at me like I was some kind of superstar. I got the weirdest feeling, like a million hot needles jabbing up my spine. I had never seen anyone like her. She had pale blue eyes, totally white, practically see-through skin, a funny shower cap style hat on, with long, twisty red hair spilling out from it and reaching all the way down her back. She stretched her hands out, then wrapped her long fingers around my ankles. I have become lost, she sobbed. I felt trapped. The weird girl didn't let go of my ankles. A shiver shot up my legs. I laughed. I couldn't help it. Sometimes I laugh when I'm nervous. Then I tried to wriggle free, But this girl was seriously strong. She clung on like she was drowning and I was a lifeguard. So I tried talking. Hey, are you on your way to a fancy dress party? Though I did think it was kind of early in the day for a party. 
She stared up at me, all baffled, like I was talking Chinese. Christmas party, maybe? I went on, smiling down at her awkwardly, but all she did was stare, wide-eyed and terrified looking. She still had her long fingers raised around my ankles. My heart raced. Are you keeping up? Why don't you read the next bit? What if she was mad? You got it? I know I'm reading quite fast. Nice to hear your voice. Keep going. Well done. Fantastic. She shrieked and gripped my ankles even tighter. Hey, excuse me. I shouted at her. I was getting pretty freaked out. Could you let me go? She must have understood because she loosened her grip. I nodded and showed her my opened hands like they do in films. It worked. She let go. Thanks, I said. Though it felt like a dumb thing to say, she should have said sorry. I took a step back pretty fast. My ankle throbbed. She sat up and wiped her tears with her sleeve. And that is when I really saw her clothes. She wore a long brown dress with a ruffled collar and frilly bits around the sleeves. And over the brown dress, she had on another sleeveless dress that was cream colored. She looked totally old fashioned. Even her face with her lips like a doll's and her upturned nose seemed old fashioned. Party, she said sitting on the pavement and gazing up at me, all jittery and confused like she'd just come out of a nightmare. She twisted her long hair around her fingers and I could see tears welling up in her eyes. Forgive me, but I didn't understand. So that is near the beginning of the book where Saul from our time meets Agatha Black who says that she's from 200 years ago. So if we have time, I would like you to do a little bit of storytelling. Is that okay if we got, yeah? Okay, so you still got these imagination hats on? Good, fantastic. Okay, so imagine you are Saul, okay? Imagine that you are a normal child living in Scotland. You're maybe eight or nine or 10 or 11. Maybe some of you in here are seven. Is anybody seven? Okay, all right, so whatever age you are is the age that you are, and you walk into the shop, okay, and you're just kind of enjoying yourself, and suddenly a girl almost gets knocked over, and she looks pretty strange. She talks strange, and she grabs your ankles. Yeah, and it's like, okay, what are you going to do? So remember, this is storytelling, so anything can happen, but that is, it's like I'm giving you the, the beginning of the story, and what I'd like you to do is to carry it on and imagine what's going to happen next, yeah? So we will try, and uh, we'll try and not make this too noisy, okay? So I'd like you to turn to the person next to you or you can go into groups of two or three yeah and see if you can come up with a good idea okay yeah so you three you clump together
well done. These are the listening bells. They come all the way from India and they're supposed to clean your ears. Quite strange, isn't it? Okay, so I know that wasn't very long, but, you know, ideas, you can get ideas really quickly. So um, is there any, any little group that think, yeah, we've got quite a good idea and we wouldn't mind standing up here in front of everybody and telling them? Yeah, come on, come on. Well, maybe you can, you can do it for her, yeah? Well done, let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so let's hear what happens to uh, the boy and the girl who is a bit strange. Okay, so just, just as though you're kind of telling a story, tell us what happens next. So look, at, look out there, there's your audience. Okay, well done. And then uh, she says that someone tried to run me over and then she uh, says, come with me. So she stands up and she I, I take her to see my mum and she tells her what happens. And she tells her where, um, at least tells her where she needs to go. And so we go in the car and we and then the car comes back and they try and crash into our car and then we swirl around the corner and then we go where at least we used to go and the car behind us kept following us okay. and so they, they kept following us for ages. So a bit of a car chase. Okay. All right. And where does she need to go? Um, well, I need to go to the um, it's a place, but it's like a teleport. Okay. <laughs> she's look. Have you lost your teleport? Mm -hmm. Okay. She's from a different country. She's like an alien. Okay. All right. And she's from a different time as well. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I like the car chase idea. Okay, so searching for the lost teleport, that could make a good story, actually. I think that's quite funny. Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm suggesting you do, if you fancy it, is you go home tonight and you just write down your ideas. Yeah, and then what you say to yourself is, what could happen next? And what could happen next? And then you say to yourself, what is the most exciting thing that could happen next? And, you know, just keep writing, because this is Book Week Scotland. Did you know that? So I would challenge all of you to start writing a book. And it seems to me you've both got a great idea. So well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's hear another story. Yeah, so a very different story. Well done. Out you come. Yeah. Okay, a round of applause for you. Okay, so this is your audience, and you're the storytellers, and nice big voice. So the girl lets go, and then you help her up, and then you, you both walk down to the shops together, and you get like the biscuits and then come back, and then you say to the girl, well, stay here, I need to talk to my mum, and then you go into the room, and then you um, say to mum, well, there's this strange girl, I have no idea, and she nearly got run over. And then, and then she says, okay, then let's see her. And then she comes in the room and she tells what happened. And then she says what, what time she was in. And then they kind of go to a museum. Well, they go to a museum. That's good. Looking for clues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try and find out um, what 
um, what's happened. Like Do they believe her? If somebody comes up to you and says, actually, I come from 200 years ago, do you think, yeah, right? Or do you believe her? You, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. What about the rest of you? You see, Saul, Saul thought that she was going to a fancy dress party, didn't he? Because she's got these strange clothes on. And then he thinks, maybe she's an actress. Maybe she's in a film. But okay, so you've got her, you've gone to a museum. Any other? Yes? Tell them. Well, they, um, in the museum, they find like a time machine and they, and they, ha, um, and they find a um, time machine in the museum and the girl goes in it and she presses the on button and then she goes back to the, um, back um, 20 um, years ago. Okay. And then um, the, the, the others got taken in as well. Oh, that's good. By mistake, or well, that's exciting. Okay, so Saul, or you three, you find yourself back in her time. Okay, that's good. With horses and carriages and long dresses and things like that. Good. Do you want to add a wee bit? Okay. Good. I think that is a really good idea for a story. And do you remember I said at the beginning, ideas have got to start somewhere? Yeah? So, you know, all of you have started with the idea of a story and just carry on. Yeah? I think it's a great idea. So, are you three pals? So, maybe you could get together and write a book. Good. I love when children write books. That's fantastic. So round of applause for you. Thank you. Maybe we could, is there uh, anybody from Pincaitlin School that's got a good idea? Come on, come and tell us. Come on, chaps, round of applause for you. Okay, yeah, so who's going to be the storyteller? Okay, tell them. First, um, the girl lets go of his legs and says, um, sorry for grabbing one two legs, I just felt nervous. Mm -hmm. And then the boy says, do you want to come along to the shop with me? Yeah, so basically, he just said yes. And then, um, the boy says, um, do you have fat um, parents? And she says, no. So he and go, take her back to their house and say, um, Mum, I just found a girl that doesn't have any parents and then um, got ran over. Okay. <laughs> now, let me ask you, does she know what biscuits are? I don't know. Did they have biscuits 200 years ago? No. Don't know. You know, they didn't have, unless you were rich. Remember these rich boys? People didn't have sugar. You imagine that? Yeah, no sweeties. Yeah, so she may have never seen a biscuit in her life. So what, are they going to adopt this girl? Is she going to live with them or? Okay, okay, the lost girl. Yeah, the girl from nowhere. Yeah, I mean, again, that could be a great story. Do you think you could work on it? Go on. Go on, that is your challenge, yeah? Write a book. Okay, well done, thank you. Okay, so um, what about Humby? Have you got a little idea? Okay, do you want to quickly come out? And then we'll just finish with any questions that you might like to ask me, so you can be thinking. You got any questions up your sleeve? Okay, Humby, hello. Right, what happens next? Tell them. Um, well, then she gets up and punches Saul in the face. <laughs> uh, and then he falls down onto the ground and she puts her foot onto his chest. Okay. <laughs> but then right. Saul then 
pushes her off and then they get up and, and then they start sort of fighting in the street. Then the police come along <laughs> and then the girl steals the policeman's truck and knocks him out. <laughs> <laughs> So, so children 200 years ago were pretty strong. Yeah. yeah, okay. And have you got anything to add to this rather um, interesting story? No. <laughs> what do you think of his ideas? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, quite dynamic. You got a few laughs. Okay, well, you know, just keep writing and see what happens. See what happens. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so if anybody has a question to ask me, yes, sir. Sorry? Why did I start being an author? Well, I always, I always wanted to be a writer, actually. And uh, when I was like 19, I went to study journalism and I became a journalist, but I didn't like it very much, actually. So then I trained to be an actress and do storytelling and speech and drama, but I always kind of had this idea that I wanted to write stories. So basically, do you remember I told you about the mass of the sunken ship? Yeah, well, that was, you know, that was how I got my first book published. So I suppose you kind of, you call somebody an author if they've got books published. So... Yeah, I started when I was living way in the top of Scotland by the beach. But I did write a book when I was 11 years old. And uh, it was called So You Want to Be an Athlete. And I was into being an athlete. Anybody here do athletics? Like running? Yeah, well, I used to like running. And I wrote a little book when I was 11 with lo little drawings in it of all the things you had to do to keep yourself fit. Okay, another question. Yes. How old is my first book, as in this book? Uh, not very old. It came out in 2009. So, uh, what's that, seven, six years ago? This is my latest book. It's called Wild Song, and it's for maybe P7, S1, and uh, it's about a bad boy. And this is set in Finland, because I, uh, I spent a month on an island in Finland, which was really exciting. Yes? What books do I like reading myself? Oh, all kind of books. I like reading books by good writers. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose kind of literary books where not much happens. I don't really like crime, you know, but yeah, I, I like reading, yeah, yes. How long does it take me to come up with the name of a book? That's a good question. I'm pretty rubbish at that, actually, because, see, this book, I called this book The Boy Under the Sea. Do you think that's a good title? No? no? My publisher said, we don't like that title. And I called him, you can see him there, he's getting eaten by a monster. He's got a wetsuit on. I called him Donald Finn. And they said, there's nothing wrong with the name Donald, but we would like you to call him Magnus Finn. So I said, okay. And so it was actually the publishers that came up with this name, Magnus Finn and the Ocean Quest. Yeah, some people are good at titles. Are you good at titles? No, <laughs> yeah, I'm not great at titles, um, but yeah, I came up with this title, Wild Song, I like this title, and uh, this is a very beautiful book, I came up with this title, Selkie Girl, it's got the most beautiful pictures in it, look at her, swimming under the sea, yes, do I what, sorry, do I read my own books? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I read them loads when I'm writing them. And you see, when you write a book, you rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Do you have to do that in school? No? 
Um, well, you need quite a lot of patience to be a, re a writer because you keep, you know, doing it again and again. So, yeah, but I, I don't really read the books once they're published, but maybe I should. Yeah. Yes? I ever made a scary story? Um, not really. Um, I mean, there are scary bits. You know, like in this book, The Reluctant Time Traveller, which is the next book, Saul, a bit like your idea, where was it? Saul goes back, or your idea, he goes back a hundred years. So what happened a hundred years ago? Do you know? Can you tell? That's right. So he goes back a hundred years in Scotland and he kind of gets himself a bit involved in the beginning of the First World War. So, yeah. Why, do you like scary stories? Who asked me that question about, do you like scary stories? Do you? Yeah. So you could write a scary story. Okay. Okay, good, good. Yes. Uh, not me. So they're all different people. Uh, this, the accidental time traveler is a girl, ca girl called Nicola. I think, who lives in England. And here, very beautiful pictures. Um, this is an Indian woman called, this is a lovely picture, don't you think? She's called Ruhsi Masani. So all different people, but not me. So maybe we have time for two more questions. Whose voice have I not heard? Yours. What is it like being an author? That's a great question. Well, it's really nice to come to beautiful schools like this, yeah, and to meet you, that's really nice, because as well as an author, I teach creative writing, and I also like teaching children to write stories. So that's, you know, that's an exciting part, and then the other part of being an author is that you sit on your own at your wee typewriter, I mean, not your typewriter, that makes me sound completely ancient, you probably don't even know what a typewriter is. Do <laughs> you? My laptop, I should say. And there, you've just got to be on your own. But you're not really on your own because you're with your imagination. Yeah? And you're, you're creating all these characters. Okay, last question. Who's got a question that feels like the end? Yes, my dear. Mm, my favorite book that I've written. That is a really difficult question. I mean, this is really, you're too old for this, but this is a true story. Remember I told you I lived up there? Remember I told you there's a cottage, a bit of grass in the front? Well, one morning I looked out the window and I saw what I thought was a white stone lying on the grass. And I crept outside towards that white stone. I got closer and closer. And what did that white stone do? It lifted its head and looked at me. And it had little eyes and a little nose, little lips, little whiskers. And I said to it, hello, you're a baby seal and you've just been born in my garden. So that was quite exciting. So if you've got wee brothers or sisters, you could get them this for the Christmas. Um, but I kind of, I like all the books, I must say. It's hard to have a you know, have a favourite. I'm writing a new book at the moment about a wishing tree where you tie a rag and you put it onto a tree and make a wish. So I hope that all your wishes come true, whatever they are. I do have some books for sale and I think what we're going to do is if you would like to buy a book, then if you can just make a wee queue or something and then the others will probably go back to your classrooms. So thank you very much, Penn Caitland and Ormiston and Humby. Thank you. Thank you.